All right, hello everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the expiration, uh, kind of an exploration of the challenges uh, that we faced in design system change management and to kind of give you a bit of a taste of how we set up in Burberry and how we solve some of those problems. It's actually really helpful to hear both uh, Heldeny and, um, and of course Didier's talk because there's a lot of things that I relate to in that. I think we share a lot of similar challenges. Um, so I kind of wanted to start by asking the question, should the component library of your design system act as a reference or be directly integrated into your apps? Of course, the answer to this can be either, but when I started out working on our design system at Burberry, I was adamant that it should be the latter. I've talked previously on the subject of having grand visions that need to ultimately be grounded in reality and how we often get carried away by our comparisons to large tech companies with abundant resources. That utopic view of seamless integration of design changes into production comprised of Matthew Strom inspired design APIs syncing cleverly with Yancix's Figma tokens plugin and design token frameworks like DS or Specify or Style Dictionary make, making changes achievable at the click of a button. Of course, I'm being hyperbolic here, uh, but the ambitious goals I had when I set out to help develop a design system culture at Burberry, which obviously I think is about a mindset shift internally, were to bring designers and engineers closer together in their working practice, to provide both business and design benefit through improving speed of feature delivery, and finally, enabling UI changes at scale. And it was really this last point that I found myself fixating on. It was something where historically there had been a, always, always been a disconnect uh, between designers wanting to make visual changes to either align with how the brand had changed or how the UI patterns were changing site-wide, so how that was evolving in this instance on the web, and how this was prioritized by product managers and then consequently implemented by engineers. But what has all this got to do with change management of design systems? Well, a definition of change management is a systematic approach to dealing with the transition or transformation of an organization's goals, processes, or technologies. And actually, a lot of this was alluded to in Didier's thought. The purpose of change management is to implement strategies for affecting change, controlling change, and helping people to adapt to change. In my view, one of the core tenets of a design system is to maintain a degree of visual consistency and coherency of the brands. This means that each element should look and feel part of a greater whole. I believe that the design system could be that agent for change in process, visual evolution, and maintenance of our platforms. My hope, perhaps optimistically, was that by showing the interrelation between the structure of UI components, their properties, and their design tokens, that when changes inevitably occurred, these modifications could cascade through. And this was something that I had as an ongoing conversation with engineers, thinking about maybe setting up these design APIs and being able to kind of uh, build this process into our continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines. Historically, negotiating with product managers for UI changes had been challenging, as a clear business value around consistency was not always sufficient. My intent, at least, to make that consistency easier to maintain could mean that changes could be made less painfully or expensively. To understand some of the challenges associated with change management, it's worth delving a little bit more into how the product teams uh, for Burberry.com operate. Each product team focuses on a different section of the customer journey, from viewing campaign pages to browsing products, selecting them and checking out, and even levels of localization. As each product team has its own set of priorities, focusing on bringing value to each part of the customer experience, it can often be hard to align roadmaps when it comes to shared functionality. As each product team has its own engineers governing their own code repository, when a feature is needed across multiple teams, the code is commonly merged into what we refer to as the common repository or the common repo. This is something that is generally quite common practice, particularly in multi uh, sort of uh, multi front end environments where you have sorry micro front end environments where you have this kind of setup. It's the responsibility of each team to contribute anything that is shareable. Think things such as session sharing, security integrations, and even some UI elements into the common repo. 
The challenge is that when tech debt or design debt inevitably accrues, as Heldeny was highlighting in his previous talk, due to tight deadlines or to scope creep, it can be difficult to define exactly where the responsibility for addressing this lies. You can often experience the bystander effect when wanting to fix it, i.e. when it's everyone's responsibility, it's no one's responsibility, which leads to no one ending up dealing with the mess. So to help solve some of the problems around ownership and the governance model, I, I thought that the common repo could act as an extension of the design system, ensuring consistency of the shared UI components across all web product teams. However, conversations with the principal engineer for web quickly highlighted that the common repo could not be the design system as I'd originally intended. The engineering view was that it was important to ensure separation of concerns. Enforcing the use of those UI components in scenarios would disempower engineers to decide the appropriate solution to distinct problems. And I think this comes back to this ongoing conversation between how design and engineering's idea, ideas of what is considered reusable can be allowed to differ. It also removes autonomy of new engineering teams to decide upon their tech stack of choice. So this comes back to this idea of compatibility and whether as frameworks evolve, as we know that you know, React is no longer kind of flavor of the, the last half decade and there's a new framework that's adopted, how do new teams start to move into that and where do they follow those UI, UI and design patterns from? And finally, uh, it can create bottlenecks waiting on a central team to deliver updates to the UI components and negate the speed to market value that a design system should offer. The view was that if a UI component looked and worked the way it was supposed to, why should design care how it was built? Thankfully, we managed to arrive at a compromise. While not, a re a re sorry, while not achieving my original goal of seamless integration, we agreed to work on building a site that could collate design specifications, UI components, and any underlying logic to act as a central reference. What this enables is a clear separation from the main application. Instead, it acts as a quality threshold by which new implementation can be benchmarked. It also allows greater freedom for both design and engineering teams in how they problem solve, empowering them with the flexibility to adapt to different scenarios. This use of, designs, this use, this use of a design system as a reference made me think about the comparison outlined by Ala Kolmatova in her book, Design Systems, where she def defines the existence of uh, two types. Strict, where designers and developers have to follow a rigorous process when introducing a new pattern in a system. Or loose, the system acts merely as a framework allowing designers and developers to experiment and try various approaches. Initially, I thought and hoped we'd align more closely to the first type. But th through working with engineering, it became clear that the second type was a much better fit for our organization based on how we were set up. If you want to understand what might be best suited for your use case, here's some questions I wish we'd asked ourselves. How integrated are your design and engineering teams? I think this is a really important question. And actually, the, 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 the sort of visual that I have alongside here was actually kindly sent to me by Louis. I think we all dream of this, uh, this world where we have design and tech all part of the same team, but sometimes those are separate. And in our instance, we actually work with agencies, so we're entirely separate. What autonomy do your engineers have outside of their regular uh, delivery to make UI updates? So who owns the decision for this prioritization? And I think this is another really key question because when it comes to wanting to work collaboratively with other team members, who is empowered to be able to take some of that responsibility and accountability to push those things forward without having to rely on items sitting within a backlog, being very uh, militantly managed in sprints, et cetera? Are there ways where, where you can kind of uh, bend that model in, inside your team? What sort of policy uh, do you want to maintain to keep your UI up to date? Um, what is realistic given your team structure? I think there's a really, really good example here uh, in terms of maintaining at least the update inside of Figma, which was uh, highlighted by uh, Greg Huntin. Um, and if you're interested in kind of finding a bit more about 
uh, this particular thread. If you scan the QR codes, you'll be able to see his video and explanation of how he did this. Essentially, um, he manages version numbers actually as a property inside of Figma. And as long as all of the uh, different uh, elements that sit with inside your component maintain a consistent naming convention as the version changes, if a designer then updates to the latest version of a component, they will be able to maintain their overrides. And I think this is one of those really powerful um, ideas that's kind of sparked from a conversation that Greg had with uh, Tom, who works inside of Figma, and uh, various other people within the sort of Twitter community. I think the other aspect, of course, is do you have a pol policy for deprecation of the older versions of the components? And this version here sort of highlights a way in which you can do that. He also talks about adding uh, colors and uh, making some visual change that really, really stands out. And when it comes to that deprecation, does that work within a particular time frame beyond which they are no longer supported? I.e., do your, uh, do your developers accept that there will come a point where the version number that they currently have integrated into their platform uh, is, is no longer kind of considered acceptable? Or is this just managed more on an ad hoc basis? And finally, are you trying to over-design the process? Fundamentally, it's better to be making some progress rather than none at all. And for us, being able to come to a compromise around creating uh, a reference library rather than the, uh, the closely integrated um, design system is a big achievement for us to bring design and engineering closer together. Thank you.